Yes. Excellent. So hello and welcome to the audience um, and all the panelists. This is the roundtable for why soft skills matter. And me and me and Dina are running this um, conversation. I'm glad that we have so many people here uh, participating so that we can get a good picture of why soft skills do matter and what we should learn and what we should do with those. Um, so I would propose that we would start with uh, introducing ourselves. Um, I would I would suggest that we start with uh, the participants. So uh, Marina, could you go first, please? Sure. So uh, my name is Marina. I am based in Berlin, working currently for Colibri Games, which recently joined um, Ubisoft Group in Jan this year. I'm originally from Serbia, um, and I am leading the recruiting department, if I haven't mentioned already. Um, uh, so yeah, pretty excited to be here today. Thank you. Um, how about then Natasha? Hi everyone, my name is Natasha Skult and I'm from Finland, but originally from Belgrade, Serbia, so dobar <laughs> dan. And uh, yeah, I'm from a company called MyTale, uh, but also have multiple hats in the games industry uh, in Finland and abroad through IGDA. So happy to be here and uh, soft skills are super important, especially in my day-to-day -day work as I'm leading the company. So yes, looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then maybe Jean. Oh, you're muted. We can't hear you. Why can't we hear you? Probably helps if I turn oh. my mic back on. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Jean. I am a uh, indie game dev out of Toronto, Canada, and most recently I have been combining my soft skill training of professional coaching with the game dev space. So I've been doing a lot of career coaching for game devs with the emphasis on soft skills. And I launched a podcast, which is called Games, Grit and Gratitude, which is about soft skills meets game dev. Um, so this panel is really important to me. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining. Um, then maybe Luca. Hi, I'm Luca. I work for SIA in Berlin at a school and I'm uh, head of the game departments. I wore different hats throughout the game industry and um, everywhere soft skills matter. And the place where I definitely developed most the most of them has been in organizing events for my teenage years and my twenties. And um, I still do that, but less now. And, and working with volunteers, that's definitely, if you don't have soft skills there, it's, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Volunteers are a, are a special type of people. Uh, then how about Ray? Uh, hi, my name is Ray Grimm. Um, I'm from Berlin and I'm from GamePro. So we are basically one of Germany's um, biggest media outlets um, concerning gaming. So basically my whole point of view um, when it comes to soft skills is from the media side of things. And yes, I can just say they're very important. Thank you. Uh, then Rai Ming, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes, good morning. It's Ru Ming and uh, I'm in LA. So a very good morning to everyone. Um, <laughs> I have, uh, I'm currently working at Exola and it's the video game business engine. And I have been in the gaming industry. I'm not gonna age myself, but for over a couple decades, so I've run the gamut. Um, uh, I had a global communications. And so I've always been in PR, but right now as you, you know, I started at Activision for a very long time. So a large public company and I've subsequently worked at startups. And so for startups, it's uh, the smaller companies. It's very important to um, kind of help people along with the soft skills while they're building a company and um, really trying to grow their own identity and grow their internal culture. So I help a lot with the um, employee uh, communications and stuff as well, so. Hmm. Sounds exciting. Thank you. Uh, then Celia. Hello, uh, I'm Zonia 
located in Hamburg right now. And so for us, it's it's lunchtime, actually. I'm sorry for you, Rai, for being so early. In the... Actually, it's not the morning. It's the night for you, I would say. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, working at InnoGames, currently um, leading a team of talent acquisition and HR marketing managers. So me, myself, being a psychologist, and then my job having to deal with soft skills all the time. So very happy to be in this panel and looking forward to your thoughts and views on this topic, definitely. Thank you. Then how about Ruth? Hello, my name is Ruth. I'm based in Berlin. I'm working as a business coach and consultant. I'm also the co-founder of Feminize, so uh, I'm happy to see you all here. Um, I'm working in the games industry for, for more than 20 years. Uh, in between from 2006 until 2013, I was um, with the German uh, trade association then called BIU, and I was the project manager for all the events among those uh, also the gamescom so i'm very much looking forward to this exchange exchange because uh, i think soft skills are very important in our business and um, i'm happy to learn from you and to exchange all our experiences thank you then sarah hi nice to meet you all I'm uh, currently the brand lead, man brand, lead, lead brand manager in Riot Games for our German speaking audience. We are based in Berlin. Um, I'm from the south of Germany um, originally, um, did a few years in Ireland with our headquarters there, and now I'm uh, back to Berlin um, in Germany. I've joined Riot Games uh, nine years ago. Um, so I have been through a very uh, different kind of, um, we have been very different kind of companies throughout the years. We have been coming from being very uh, small and a very startup-y in, in my first years to becoming a really big organization with uh, finally more than one game. And I also have to say throughout all those years, I think uh, having soft skills and developing soft skills has been the most important part of the skills I developed and used. Thank you. Then I would have Magre. <laughs> is, is that the real name? Yes. Oh, sorry, that's, um, that's Maxi. I just got so okay. with my short yeah, yeah, yeah. like, that's I'm just going to type it in real quick. Yeah, uh, yeah. But Maxi um, from Munich. Um, I'm with Microsoft. I work there now for five years, I'm currently at home office, and I think uh, an ambulance is passing through, so apologies. Oh. But uh, <laughs> I used to lead the, um, the PR for Xbox um, for the German speaking area for three years. And now for two years, um, I'm leading the marketing communications. And one of my favorite soft skills is allyship. Um, we're actually, I'm going through a training to become a trainer in allyship. So I'm, I'm very happy to share um, my, my knowledge with the group on this one. Great, thank you. Then, uh, John Sheila, good to have you on board. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Drusilla. Uh, I'm from Supercell. I've been in the games industry for about 17 years, mostly as a game designer and game lead. So in my job, I had to use a lot of soft skills. So that's why uh, I think they're really important. Um, and then also more recently, I was involved in the project of uh, founding, I was leading the, the founding of Hive Helsinki, which is a different kind of coding school in Finland, uh, and which is a, a school where you not just learn coding, but a lot of soft skills. And um, I just gave a keynote actually before this panel about, about the experience with that school and how the students learn soft skills there. Cool, thank you. Uh, then, then I would go to Dina, <laughs> the co-host for the panel. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we work together, me and Carolina, at uh, Sara, um, which is a startup here in, in Finland, Helsinki. As a community manager, it's incredibly important to focus on soft skills because you're talking to people every single day about what you're doing and the brand. And it's incredibly important to, you know, 
get people on board and uh, listen to what they have to say. Thank you. So uh, I'll go last. I think we went to everyone else. Good. Yes. So uh, me and Dina are hosting this panel. I'm Carolina. I'm the best known as the um, having worked as the lead designer of City Skylines. Nowadays, I'm running a, a startup company where I had the privilege to work with Dina. Dina is handling the community side of things, and I'm doing mostly the um, design and then running the development side. I'm the CEO of uh, Tent News, and where we are developing the project Sana um, with a small team in in Helsinki. But then to to the soft skills, I would uh, I would suggest that Dina, if you go first with the questions to to the rest of the panelists, uh, maybe just start. We could start by defining soft skills, maybe even at least for me as a person of a design background, I I would be interested to hear on what people think are the soft skills. So what do you think, Dina? Would we go with this? Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Should we start with Marina? Mm -hmm. Sure. When you hear soft skills, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Um, I would say the first thing that comes to mind is the way people interact with one another. Um, probably non-technical skills um, in comparison with hard skills that enable people to communicate more effectively with others. Collaborate. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Uh, Natasha? Yeah, well, for, for me, uh, not to repeat what we just said, but basically, um, uh, it's it's all about communicating and the, one of the main things of communication is actually listening listening is the main part of communicating <laughs> so so for me also even when i'm you know leading the team but also working with the clients and whatever like however any part of work but also day life kind of like with the family and everyone else friends listening is a, for me the most important actually soft skill from all of that um, and then that's the, the basis of actual communication. But yes, communication would be for me. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, Jean, would you have anything to add on what you think about when you hear the word soft skills? I, what I would like to add is that yes to, to both of what has just been said, but also the addition of empathy and compassion. And I think that good listening comes from being empathetic being willing to be curious and willing to listen to somebody else's perspective goes a long way in those soft skills. Thank you. Luca, when you think about soft skills, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? And a lot of things have been said, but if I try to think, I think probably self-awareness is really important in soft skills, like realizing what your place is in a team or or how other people uh, think and, and realize, for example, collaborating with somebody that is a different specialty requires being able to imagine what it means to do that job. And that's, that requires attention, listening skills, but also self-awareness or realizing what your limits are. Um, yeah. Thank you. Ri, um, you work a lot with media and for you, what is soft skills? Skill. Um, it's hard actually to to add something to uh, in terms of definition to what was just said, but um, for me, soft skills is not only the um, the social part, but also um, skills that are not as easily defined by I don't know numbers, for example, or not easily pinned down. Things like um, flex flexibility, strong nerves, or even openness to feedback, which yes, is kind of a communication skill too. Um, but those things are very, very important when it comes to um, to soft skills from my perspective. Thank you, Celia. That's a background with the philosophy. I'm sure you have something to add. <clears throat> Yep, psychology, though I, I am not a big philosoph philosopher, though, but <laughs> um, yeah, to actually, so many things are already totally coming, um, makes sense with what the guys already said. So for me, I mean, in our daily business, when it's about finding the right people to work with us on our games, to work, join our teams and join forces, it's mainly about, when I explain it, it's, it's, it's not a hard skill um, that we can easily measure or have a certificate in or can see in zero or one. 
Um, it's something that is not that tangible, but processing soft skills actually can make your, your biggest talents even greater because then you are able to um, transfer your knowledge to other people. You can um, teach them, you can bring a team together to, to follow a, a common goal, right? So these are all things that I would say as soft skills and above all that was already mentioned. Um, it's also about, let's say, self-management. So not only reflecting, being able to, to step away and reflect what I've just done, what I've said, how I manage things, but also how processes go and stuff like this, to go on a meta level and um, process things a little bit differently and take a different approach, which we all had to prove when we switch to mainly remote work right now, I guess, um, that we can do this as human beings, let's say. But all the other things said, I agree. Thank you. Uh, Ruth, you do business coaching. So for you, it's all about transferring knowledge to others. For you, um, how do you approach soft skills? I think a lot of uh, things have already been said and uh, I can only echo that, but I would like to add one more uh, aspect that is, uh, I think, at the very beginning of all the things that have been said, I think it's respect to, to be respectful for the others and for, 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 the, for the other ones I'm interacting with, uh, I'm working together with in a team. I think this is something that is um, very much at the, along with empathy maybe, uh, it's uh, very much at the beginning uh, uh, of all the, the, the ground of, of, all, uh, of all soft skills. And uh, I think uh, that this is uh, helping to develop further other soft skills. If you if you understand that you uh, well that you part of something that is bigger than yourself and your uh, and the the things you are adding to a team, then I think it's uh, it's already a lot of uh, has been understood already. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, you do a lot of brand management, right? So for you, it'd be incredibly important with which soft skills and how do you approach that? So yeah, so I feel like a lot of them already have been mentioned. I would say like empathy, like knowing what your audience likes, how your audience um, reacts, how your audience feels. Um, that is very important. But I think the two I came up with when I thought about this workshop and what was really important was was the most important soft skill I used the last years. And I think we all uh, had to use it this year. I would say adaptability and resilience. Um, I think we all know that in gaming, things change really fast. We constantly, we cancel projects, budgets are cut or shifted. And I feel like using like positive creativity to change right you know like we all had planned offline events i guess um at the beginning of the year and then not just being upset and just going online but um also taking the opportunity to improve them right so we we had an offline workshop but then if we go online yes we can invite more people we can invite people from different locations that might have not traveled here and i feel like this is a very important skill that you know brings you forward and helps you keep motivated in in the daily um, changing life as a, a game industry person. Thank you. Maxi, um, when you approach soft skills uh, in your work as mar with marketing, uh, what do you do? Well, first of all, thank you that you remember my name while I was writing Mark Ray in my <laughs> <laughs> in my video. I saw the joke, Ray. Right? It was very good in the comments. Um, I mean, if I think of soft skills and generally communication would be like everybody else said the first comes to mind. If I think of soft skills right now, as for example, we're launching the console in like less than two weeks, my number one soft skill is organization. And I swear I would really go on the ground and cry if I haven't had to learn that soft skill like in the last years a lot. So yeah. Thank you. Drusilla, um, you've recently done a keynote, so you probably have a lot to add here. Yeah, but um, where to start? No, I'll try to brief. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of people said great things already. The first thing that comes to mind is the teamwork. 
Uh, the keynote was around four soft skills, teamwork, one of them, and then also independence, resilience, and problem solving. And uh, I, I, all of them uh, in my keynote, I was explaining how they were very useful for me personally in my career, but also like how the students at this high school that I, I, I talked about, like how they develop these skills and they are uh, in, in, in the battle of so many other like great skills like those were the ones that I feel that the combination of them really are future-proof skills that will help you like tackle anything and learn anything and learn other skills uh, as you go along and with the independence resilience and problem solving there's a lot of it's more focused on the self in, in a way and then the teamwork is more like when you are obviously like working with others and when you put that on top of your own like skills and, and and the way that you work like it just magnifies you and it makes you a better like version of yourself and together when you put like many people together like solving problems together then greater things come as a result um so that's why i think they're all like very important combined thank you uh Ruming, you done a lot of startup work so i'm probably you're familiar with teamwork and problem solving Yes. Well, I mean, it was interesting. So the career has been interesting just because I started, you know, in PR, they always want you to start an agency so that you learn how to service a lot of different clients, right? But even at Activision, you know, I was there for 12 years, we were, um, were considered services, right? So you definitely have to work across all departments and you also, and we're very global, right? So that's my biggest thing is also, not just being empathetic, but um, being able to communicate and be sensitive to cultural differences and the way that different um, countries, your different countrymen like sort of uh, communicate, right? So, you know, right now at Exola, we have a very large team in Russia. Um, I, they're not apt to speak up very much. And so it's like when we're in big group meetings, like nobody speaks up. And so for me, I'm always like, come on, let's 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 get some information out there. Like how and, and it's definitely not about feelings, right? It's always about the data, it's about this. And so um working as a team, you really want to sort of pull for me, I'm obsessed with data in a way where it's um I want to know every little thing that goes into a project, even if it's not my department, right? And so it's um it's a matter of yes organization but it's a matter of collecting that data but it's a matter of um being able to communicate well um across departments and across cultures right and just trying to get the most and best out of everyone and hoping that i can influence folks and, and i think i have it's like i definitely encourage people to speak up and and sort of, you know, if there's a problem, we all need to solve it together, right? Like it shouldn't be siloed. And I think that works best. So, you know, I definitely, you know, we work with Asia, uh, we have an office in South Korea and as well. And so it's, uh, it's fun. I mean, I like it. I, I love working globally and adapting, like everybody said. Thank you. I see we have a, um, a question from Max is saying we should probably talk about active listening um, and listening in, in general. Maybe you would want to take that round, Carolina. May, may I, uh, yeah, may I uh, add to this uh, that all the, all the participants, uh, the audience, if you have questions, there is a Q&A button or you can uh, type it in the chat, but let's try to do it through the Q&A. We already have one question. I think that's really good. Because to make the most of this panel, I think we should should be answering the questions as we go. There is a short uh, time for separate questions and answers in the end, but I think we're better to go with answering the questions as we go. But Dina, so you suggested that we should talk about the active listening first. So, um, so yeah, active listening is clearly one of the key skills, uh, soft skills, uh, for example, that Natasha mentioned already when defining soft skills. Um, what, would someone have, if someone wants to learn active listening, what would be your best tips for that? Who wants to go first? Marina, did you have a, 
yeah, please. Sure, I can I can go. Um, so I think that uh, for me, two things are important, and I'm also saying this as somebody who, as you know, person who leads a team, I I feel like it's really important for us managers to kind of be really on top of this and to be able to um, to constantly reevaluate how uh, we approach uh, listening with with uh, our teams and our colleagues. Um, so yeah, two things. Uh, one of them is speak less. Uh, and the second one is curiosity. So I think that's really important in order to be able to active, to be um, an active listener. Um, I think we can all listen, that's, uh, that's quite clear, or we can at least hear, um, but uh, there's only a limited amount of people who can really be active listeners and who can give the other person uh, that sense of being acknowledged, like Jean said, basically showing empathy and being able to, um, to let the other person know that you can relate to them and that you can understand them. Um, so yeah, that would be it for me. Yeah. Anyone else? Any any thoughts on active listening? Because I think this sounds like it's it's partly about maybe if I go to summarize, it's partly about not just listening, but making sure that the other person knows that they are being listened to and understanding that that this person wants to understand you and wants to wants to hear about you. I don't know if people are familiar with the, the military phrase hua. Like you'll hear it in army movies and be like hua. And it actually stands for H U A, which is heard, understood, acknowledged. It means I heard the command, I understand what you're asking of me, and I acknowledge responsibility for it. But when you flip it around, when you're talking about people skills, I hear you, I understand you, and I'm acknowledging you in the moment. And it, it frames it so that it's about us reserving our judgment and creating and holding space for people to be able to speak. And I don't think we talk enough. And, you know, I've been coaching for 12 years. That's all they ever talk about is holding space, holding space. But we don't necessarily talk about that as a skill in game dev because we're so focused on making a thing rather than how we show up and how we be. And so I'd really like for us to have more communities where we talk about holding space and being active listeners. And I just wanna follow that up with, the other thing that I really loved about my coach training was this idea that people are naturally creative, resourceful and whole. So when you are in a situation and you're being an active listener, it doesn't mean that you have to fix somebody's problem. They, they are capable of figuring out what the problem is. They, with a little bit of guidance, can probably figure out what the what the solution is and they're not broken. So one of the things that I notice the more masculine uh, behavior is to like try to fix somebody. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's when active listening goes off the rails. So just spa stay in that space of empathy and curiosity. Well, Jean, don't you think it's also, if you're gonna say from the male or female perspective, is it? So for me, I, like to help by just asking the questions also, right? It's like, did you think about this? Or what about this? Versus like, well, this is how it is, right? Or like, you should do it this way, right? I guess it's also active learning can also, or I'm sorry, active listening should also be like, I hear you. And then what about some ideas uh, to help you? Or like, is that even what you're looking for? Are you just trying to bounce ideas off? I guess, I guess active listening can also start with like, what's your goal of the conversation, right? It's like, are they actually looking for advice from you or are they um, are just spitballing, right? It's like, are we just brainstorming? So are we passing ideas around or is it, hey, I'm literally just going to throw this idea out at you. What do you think, like, yes, no. Like, I guess it's also just depending on the person who's like asking the questions you're having the conversations with. Yeah. I mean, I think oftentimes people just jump in and they want to fix the problem because they, they're uncomfortable listening. They're uncomfortable holding space. And so if we can teach people what active listening looks like and feels like, then they'll understand that creating that space means not rushing in with the answers and giving people the opportunity to figure it out for themselves. Yes. And I think one thing to add um, <clears throat> as a start, if you want to train that and you want to improve that skill of active listening, it's such a good tool to first what Marina said, shut up, first thing, and try to paraphrase what the other one was saying to you. 
<clears throat> and um, give the total view of what you perceive. So that's not only repeating the ver words, it's also what you, the tone, and maybe you feel that the person is maybe rather disappointed, sad, or lost or something. And sometimes you don't even have to ask like this coaching questions, what have you done? What, what do you think might be helping? What, what else can you do? But by paraphrasing what the other person is actually was saying, sometimes they're like, yeah, you're right. Actually, I'm just, I'm just sad. And thanks for, for actually perceiving the sadness in me. And now I can go on, right? So you actually prove that you listened and the person actually gets reflected how he or she is actually also perceived in that moment. And trying, training that in every meeting you have to get this as a normal autopilot thing, let's say. That can also help. That's an I think, um, sorry, I wanna echo two things. I think the first thing is an active listening is to not while the other person talks, think about a solution. I think Jen, you uh, mentioned that too. I feel like sitting in a, you know, I think that's the normal way we think, right? They say, oh, I have this really big problem and then we immediately come up with solutions ourselves. So I would say, yeah, sh shut up, but also shut up in your brain and listen and then work out the solution together. And um, plus one on the training. I actually think instead of just training and in meetings, um, we, we sometimes do it where you, you grab someone you really trust and you sit opposite and you like watch each other in the face and then one person is telling a story and you try to, your hardest to listen like don't go wandering with your brain just really concentrate on the story and usually it can be a very boring story you know what did you do yesterday and then follow up with questions but I think the important thing is when you come with questions and when you repeat that person to do it on a level where they don't feel mocked. So I feel like, you know, they're, they're, you don't want to feel it robotic again. This is a, it's mm -hmm. active listening, not just go into like, oh, you just repeat the last sentence the person said because this is what you heard somewhere. But like really train it with friends or with colleagues you trust. And it's actually really hard. Like, it doesn't sound hard, but just shutting up for five minutes and not go wandering with your brain is the hardest thing you can do. But I also have a question then, because if, if someone does not have a lot of EQ, say, right? So they cannot read other people's emotions or don't understand where someone's coming from, and they're actually a leader, right? If they're a leader, and this is how they function, if they don't let their employees like actually finish talking before they also like, oh, if, with, if I'm asking a question, that doesn't mean I don't understand anything that you're talking about, right? Like it doesn't mean that I don't understand the goal of the project, whatever, but if you're looking for clarification and then someone jumps down your throat because they can't, like it's just about them, like how do you get people out of themselves like their own brains and going like you don't understand you're an idiot like because they can't communicate it properly or you're just asking for clarification right and it's like I, I don't even know like, I don't know where to go with that it's like do, so do, you, do you mean um that when when a leader is unable to understand that someone is trying to communicate with them and ask for clarification and instead goes on a like a sidetrack of like why are you asking questions are you stupid or something how, yes how could we yes. support this like the, the learning yeah like how do you actually even flip that to be like no no i'm just asking so that we do everything right and towards your vision hmm. how do you get someone to clarify when when hmm. that's the response right yeah that's an excellent question that does someone have oh natasha you go uh i i i happen to have this experience on the on the so basically um this is also in the academic field especially uh so it, it happens quite often so one of the ways i'm not saying this is the solution obviously but one of the ways that the best practices that i have seen and what i practice also especially with the developers, to be honest, <laughs> because also with the, literally with coders. Um, since I'm not a coder, but 
again, I do understand and I want to understand what's happening everywhere in every aspect of our work and so on. Um, so, so basically how to do it is to ask in a way that you start with, with this sort of fact, stuff that you know, like, okay, so in your vision, we are doing this and this and this. So according to all of that, so that you, you give them information that you already know exactly all about that. So basically it's like, it's not about that just now, how do we precisely, you know, like, what do you think about this then precise detail here, here and here? And basically in that way, it's a communication and discussion instead of asking questions. So basically uh, even, and this is something that I do also other way around, uh, just to, sorry, hop on the <laughs> previous thing with the uh, active communication. I think, one big important aspect of active communication is that it's active, meaning it takes time. Uh, so it's not something that happens like you and I have now meeting, you tell me whatever it is, and I'll like either give a solution as usually men do, or we do this sort of like that, okay, let's think this together. But for some people, because again, everyone is in which, and it can be personal current mood, it can be so many different factors that affect not just that person, but you also, you're human too, like we leaders, like we have to deal with ourselves as well, and dealing and being this sort of objective and, and effective for everyone else. So um, basically, how to deal with that is is also, again, just from, from kind of like my, my <laughs> experience is that, you know, like, it takes time for some people, it's not just easy that you say that, okay, maybe this, that, that way, and maybe ask questions as it was, because for some people that work, and maybe it's something so simple that can be, oh, yeah, you're right, yeah, I didn't like, yeah, sure, I'm on it, off I go. But sometimes it will take days to actually really pinpoint, like, why, how, what is the issue, where, and so on. And this is something that would require a bit more like longer term, and that's why I think that for active listening, it's not just listening like this, like actively for a meeting time, but actually it's finding that solution with the team, if it's a team thing that can be, so ask others around as well. Uh, so, so this is at least something that as an indie studio, we are very much in our studio, having this as a, as a part of company culture. But this is something that again, in the more like bigger corporations, obviously it's slightly different. Uh, well, slightly, uh, but, but, uh, but this is at least some of the practices that I have found throughout the years, also in academic field, but in the, in the games industry, working with and leading the teams that kind of like how to handle these sort of situations in a way that you also as, as like really understand and, and able to help. I hope this was clear. Hmm. Thank you. I think that's a, that's a really good solution definitely to to take the time to make sure that that uh, to communicate slowly and to take the time that that uh, it is needed because i would say that it's partly about the feeling of safety definitely if someone is straight away going into this like no you're an idiot why why do you ask me questions they might not be feeling safe <laughs> and with the, given the time and uh, attention and uh, and uh, discussing it might make them feel safe and then they would be okay with, with someone asking questions. I, I would actually um, continue from what Natasha said with, um, uh, do, do you have ways of supporting team members in this? Because at least I have found it to be challenging to um, in a small team to make sure that people remember to talk to the other team members, like just that um, it might not make sense for them to come to me as the leader with the problem when I'm like, well, well, Dina actually knows, like, like go to Dina, uh, so that they would maybe think about this in a more uh, holistic way of like, we have all of these wonderful people in the team, like, uh, go on and reach out and just, or just plop on the Slack general channel of like, I'm thinking about this, who can bounce these ideas with me? How, how could we support the team members in this? Any ideas or thoughts? I can add something. Um, I think there are two ways. Um, first, what, like what you could do is create like V teams around certain topics. Um, so, you know, you say you want to, I don't know, make an in inclusive event and would you two guys, you know, Co make a collaboration together and work on this together. So make it kind of a cultural habit in your team um, to solve problems together. And the other way 
when I started at Microsoft, like we have quarterly manager um, feedback discussions. And there are always two questions I kind of need to answer is, A, um, how did I help other people in my team to succeed? Like, how did I support them? And then B, um, which was the harder part for me, when did I ask for help for people to support me? Um, which was always the hardest part and I was still struggling with this, but it's super helpful. And this kind of created a mindset over the years um, that I actually felt comfortable to go to people and to ask for help um, and to not feel stupid when I ask for help or that I didn't succeed. Um, so this was super helpful. I think it's a routine of elements you can include in your, um, in your team structure. I think this is a very uh, interesting point, and I'm thinking uh, uh, of this or about this uh, quite a lot, uh, uh, especially in the past months of being uh, working remotely uh, at the main time. Uh, so how can you, um, uh, well, the question was, how can leaders integrate everybody or make everybody being heard? Uh, in the team, uh, and I think this is is a challenge because people are very different. Some uh, some of them are rather introvert. They are not. Uh, they are shy. Uh, they they need a, a safe space uh, to to uh, be able at all to to address what they have on their minds. Um, but I think this can be somehow also being initiated in a, in a kind of a process uh, as maxi said uh, that you that you have uh, like uh, groups that are smaller that deal with a certain po uh, problem that you ask um, actively the opinion of people that you are knowing that are not uh, not involved in the po being involved in the process as much uh, that you try to um, to uh, make them all be part of the of the mission, of the overall mission of, or, or of the, or what the what the project should be. I think this is very important. Um, uh, I, I'm always, um, I did a lot of project management, obviously, when I was working with the association. And uh, what helped me quite a lot was the idea of when being at a kid at school, I was part of the school orchestra. And I was uh, playing percussion. This is not very it's uh, not a leading role, but sometimes I had parts where even with my triangle, I was the leading, uh, leading part of the, of, the, of the music we were playing. And I think I never had, uh, oh, uh, project management is, is comparable because we are all being part of the, of the overall project that is coming out of it. And it's very rewarding if everybody is giving his voice and his, uh, his part into it. And I think uh, um, the main challenge is for leaders to, um, to integrate this all properly and, uh, um, and to, to make everybody, everybody be, feel, feel part of the mission and be active in that mission. Um, and uh, I have, having said that, I have a question as well. This is, I think for me, it's getting even tougher with now the all the technology technology being involved because this is also uh, we, we were talking about active listening this is so much easier if you are not talking to a screen uh, and because you have you are losing so much information because uh, how are people sitting how are they moving with their hands what what are they really thinking i think there are so many collateral information that we are losing at the moment which can be maybe an advantage, but in some points, I think it's really difficult. And I really would like to, uh, to learn more about what, how, how are you dealing with that? If you are leading a team, for example, I'm not dealing with teams at the moment, but if you are leading a team, how do you deal with that? Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think Luca, Luca, did you have something to add to the previous one? But it was before the question. Okay. I think okay. it's well, more interesting okay. to follow up the question. Yes, okay. So I had a, um, cause I had a thought before you asked that as well, but it fits with that Ruth is honestly. So for me, like I've always managed with an open door policy, right? So it's, if anybody has, and this is literally when I'm interviewing anyone, even to bring them in as part of our team, whether they're on my direct team or if it's a dotted line or anything, I literally say, listen, always open door. Um, 
it, it's and it's both ways, right? It's like if someone has a problem with management or a problem with what you know they don't understand, I'm always like, ask me questions. You know, I'll answer however I can. But on top of that, it's also in this day and age of work from home. Um, I don't turn my camera on a lot for for because we're on conference calls for probably like eight to six every day. And so I'm like, no, I'm in my pajamas sometimes. So I won't go on screen, but I do set up one on ones with people. Right. And it's sort of like everybody's moving so quickly that I feel like you do have to do check ins with people. Right. It's like, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Um, uh, are you doing what you want to be doing? That's also, you know, as things shift, right? And, you know, depending on how big your company is, everyone's wearing a lot of hats, right? And when we're, you're wearing a lot of hats, you don't necessarily always do what you want to be doing. So there's also check-ins like that. I just had a check-in with someone last week and they were like, oh my God, I was like, what do you want to end up doing? Like, this is on the table now. Mm. And she was like, oh my God, thank you for asking me what I want to do. So, I mean, I think it's just open door policy, having one-on-one -on -one meetings to check in. And I, you may not be able to do that if you run a team of like a hundred people, right? I just, I don't have that many <laughs> direct reports or even dotted lines, but so it's easier for me to do that. I think it's also, you can set up ground rules, um, making at the, at the beginning of each meeting. So for example, I feel like what you say, uh, rooming especially about having a safe, safe split, a space and be like okay this is a meeting we're going to talk about this project I want you to know everybody can ask any questions if you don't feel like having a camera on that's cool put all your questions in the chat even if we don't answer it in the next 30 minutes I will come back to your question in the chat and we'll answer that and really do it and this way you feel like you don't lose time you still get hurt, you still can ask anything that you want, even if it's privately and make sure that each personality and perspective is heard towards the meeting. And if you have more quiet person, also just go into the meeting and say, hey, what do you think about it? What is your perspective? What do you, you know? Uh, and being said, Ray, as an editor of Chief, you're leading a whole team. What is your perspective on this? Um, actually, I think, uh the pandemic, it, weirdly as it sounds, made a lot of things easier for me. Um, I lead a team on two, um, on two, pl at two places, two locations. Um, one part of the team is in Munich and one part of the team is in Berlin. And uh, my leadership team, uh, the team I'm in, um, who leads other teams, is in Munich too. So a lot of the time I had the problem that it wasn't seen in, in my team, in my leadership team, um, because they, had, uh, they were all in a room and they had um, a presentation and I was somewhere behind the presentation with my um, yeah with my webcam and they never basically saw I didn't get any um, any way to see how they interacted with each other or when I can uh, could actually speak up because they were having visual clues um, I did, just didn't have and everything changed this year um, I'm for the first time I really feel included in everything and I'm taking um, I could learn a lot to lead my team because I could include the people in Munich um, more into my Berlin team. So that was quite, I don't want to say easy, but it was quite refreshing for us. And right now I'm doing a lot of, a lot of talking, a lot of communication. I'm doing a lot of one-on-ones. I'm basically checking, my team is quite small, so that's a luxury. Um, in this regard, I can just, um, well, just call someone and have a um, short one-on-one -on -one, and that really helps so I can concentrate on the people, um, help them organize, help them prior, um, prioritize and can just, um, well, try to figure out their needs and give them also, um, to come back to something we said earlier, give them tasks. In, um, in terms when we have a big project and that's quite complex, I make sure that everyone gets a task. So everyone has a reason to speak up in, in a meeting when we are talking about this. So basically when we are talking about, I don't know, next gen um, and who, who covers what, or when we are talking about strategy 20, uh, 2021, um, everyone has has a responsibility um, and kind of a report um, to the whole team. So giving people bigger and small tasks so they have a place in the meeting, they know they have to speak up. So yes, that's not always easy, especially if you're, um, if you're more introverted, but I can help them with that um, and make this, um, this 
a little bit easier for them, I hope. Um, but yeah, having um, having a small team basically helps to for me to focus more on the people. So yeah, one on ones and giving everybody um, in basically in every meeting one task they have to talk about. I think um, it also comes down back to if do they feel safe to speak up? I feel like especially like um, calling out a more introverted person in a meeting and ask them. I that's what I always did for many years until someone told me um, that they get really anxious if I do this. So I actually connect with some more introverted uh, people before the meeting. And I now know um, they're fine if I ask them in front of three people, they're not fine if I ask them in front of 15 people. So I think it's important to also get to know your persons. I feel like right now, um, it got really hard because we're all in meetings all day. I see, Raimin, you said it. Um, and most of them are business meetings, right? And it's really hard to bring the energy to every single call and make the camera on and smile and be active. So what we started to do is we tried to find rituals to replace our, you know, the coffee machine talk. So mm -hmm. we play games together, but then also we have people that don't play games. So um we just have a group meeting where we, for example, talk about where we would go in holidays uh, next year or two years. And we, you know, we opened that Jamboard at the same time where people could pin pictures where they want to go and paint on it and put comments. So I feel like even if you didn't want to talk a lot because you're on meetings all day, they, they were painting on, you know, it was just like a digital whiteboard. And this really helped us to, you know, get that connection back and, get people to warm up and start talking and we invited people we usually don't work with very closely to you know just get that uh, that you know collaboration back up and then we felt like when we we didn't do any work in that meeting obviously but you know when we went out like if you talk to someone about their holiday dream of course mm -hmm. then it's easy for you to check up on slack and ask about that problem you wanted to ask them mm -hmm. I think what you just said um, that basically finding a new way of of the coffee machine talk is very important. Um, we actually have a scheduled meeting for that um, every week at, at Friday. It's called our bullshit meeting and it's basically just us talking well bullshit. Um, sometimes there is um, we have ideas for articles sure um, but basically it's just something to to unwind and just yeah well talk a little bit of shit talk about about what we read last night and uh, talk about articles that will never ever ever get written um but yeah it's it's fun and it's um it helps everyone relax a little bit and get that con uh, connection back that can be easily lost especially in uh, in times like this when there is a lot to do yeah we do that we have a sorry just we do a speaker series on fridays also to sort of um, you know, do more teaching of, of maybe some soft skills is actually um, what we do. But then afterwards, we do have a team lunch on Fridays. And so that's really like no work talk. Everybody talks about their life. Some people have their babies in their laps, um, you know, so it's, it's good fun to connect that way. And it's, and it's good to do that, you know, once a week, if you can. <clears throat> Definitely, we have to keep in mind that none of this since we are all remote, none of this is happening on the go, on the side spontaneously, like it used to in the office, right? So for, <clears throat> for people that are not necessarily keen on those situations of small talk and chit chat, they might not look for it. And now um, we have a setting where everything is a little bit more forced and organized, just like Ray just said, you have to schedule this meeting where you talk about bullshit okay now it's bullshit time yay let's go right so it's 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 super different than it used to be <clears throat> and for us we had, at inno games we had a lot of these get togethers in the evening on the rooftop terrace having a barbecue or um, having a beer or something playing games and that all was gone so we also implemented our stand-ups like the friday stand-up is now the beer prosecco whatever everyone likes can have his own drink and we just talk about what plans on the weekend and stuff like this. But of course it's scheduled, it's more forced. So everyone is also just free if they're not in the mood because they had just like eight hours of video calls, then okay, no, right? It's fine. <clears throat> but yeah, it's, it, it, it takes a bit out of this spontaneous human interaction, definitely. But, hmm. Thanks. Yeah, I had something, yeah. 
Um, I just wanted to tell a bit of one challenge I'm having now that related to all this is that I just recently started with a new team and there are two other people and we haven't worked together in the past. Um, so on top of all of this, when you're dealing with people that are still getting to know, it's been like uh, quite challenging. And, you know, I've been, I'm, I'm trying to kind of figure this out. We, we are, the good thing is that because from the beginning, you know, all this stuff that you guys are talking about, about open door policy and, you know, like that's, I think that's very important. We have very open communication, very transparent. So we are trying to kind of crack this one. So for example, right before we went back now to working from home when with, with the spikes again from, from COVID, we, we used to have lunches, we don't anymore. We used to have Friday coffee, we don't anymore. And now we are trying to think that, should we just have it like even a lunch like you know let's bring our lunches and like talk which would be similar to the bullshit time like idea just to chit chat because i'm missing that like a lot and i think in the beginning there was a bit of this thought that oh is that going to be awkward but i guess you have to just get over that like and make that your new normal in a way um but yeah it's also it's been very important to just try to still get to know each other like the one-on-ones are super like important now as well that, you know, I noticed that somebody is very quiet when the three year are talking together, but I don't want to put anybody on the spot because I don't know this person very well yet. So like, how, do, how would they, like, would they, are they more introvert uh, and they, they don't feel comfortable or uh, is it that they have a big issue with the stuff that we are talking about and they, they don't want to say what it is. So, you know, it's a little sensitive, um, so, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, to do like some one-on-ones, but still trying to figure out how can I get more of the bullshit stuff going on because that's where you start to get to know people better and bond uh, and, and, and build some trust as well. The fun thing is I just realized we drifted a bit away. <laughs> we're a little bit in the leadership and how to organize this remote work, but everything we're talking about and things that we are pointing out, we can point out because of our soft skills, right? Yeah. We wouldn't realize. Exactly. Otherwise. Yeah. And I actually even already had really deep discussions with, with the guys like about how are we, how do we communicate individually? And I always try to be the first one to kind of break the ice, you know, sometimes if I'm not following a discussion and I'm like, what the, why the hell am I not following this? Am I stupid or something? And then, uh, and then I'm like, oh no, it's because I'm a very visual person. And the way that they talk, they, they are more comfortable talking about systems in an abstract way, but I need the pictures, you know, like I need to see what's going on and we don't have any more like a board that we can easily like doodle on. And we have been trying tools online, but you know, it hasn't like fully replaced it. But then I'm just very open. I come and I'm like, sorry, it's really hard sometimes to follow because I'm very visual and I, how about you guys? Like, I noticed that you guys like are more like that. And then I kind of start this discussion so that together we can self-reflect a little bit and understand each other more. And then we were able to start like, one was like, oh, would it help if I would like create more mockups, you know, and not just assume. And I'm like, well, yeah, mockups always help. Or I, I can help making mockups too. Maybe we should have a separate meeting where it's just you and me and I make the mockups and then I, I understand what you're talking about. Um, so, you know, uh, a big trial by error, a try and error, but I think the honesty and the transparency and just the open communication, uh, active listening and active commun communication, all of that you guys talked about kind of goes into this. Can I also suggest something though? So this is something that we did at Activision and I didn't do anywhere else, but since Exola has been growing and there's, you know, over 400 employees now. And again, different offices, not sure it'll work, but I did suggest this to our HR and we're at least implementing it um, here in the States. I don't know if we're gonna do it in the other countries just yet, but something that we did at Activision that I thought was super interesting and super helpful was we ended up taking, you know, one of those personality tests, right? Or, it, you know, we did Myers-Briggs, but I think um, our HR has found some other system but really what it did was it opened, we actually printed out some of, our, at least on the PR team, we printed out our results and put them on our doors. So it was like, are you an analytical? Are you a driver? Are you like, do you just drive for results? So if you just drive for results, if someone comes in to your office, sits down and just goes, hey, I just want to wax poetic about stuff. 
a driver wants to kill you, right? Because they're like, oh my gosh, get to the point. I need to drive for results. What's happening? Or, you know, if you're like part analytical, you're just like, oh, I have all these questions. I need all these data points. So I think it's actually really helpful to do stuff like that because then you can actually see what people's work personalities are, right? It's like, how do people like to function in the workplace? It's like, do they like to ask a lot of questions? Do they just want you to shut up and work? Do you want to, you know, um, are they empathetic and are open to listening to everything, you know? So I think that's actually really helpful um, in the workplace to actually do those kind of personality tests if people are open to it. Yeah, actually, I, I, um, it's funny that you asked because, or that you mentioned because I, I, we just started doing this personality test and we've been sharing, we've been having a lot of fun with it. And we've, uh, we have even like started discussing horoscopes and things like that. <laughs> but then at the end of the day, it's more like all those things, what I find very interesting is that they are just tools for the self-reflection part. It's like this kind of icebreakers. And then we have these discussions like, oh, my profile is this. I kind of, I relate to most of it, but this is the one thing I don't relate to because I'm more like this, this and that. And then the, the, the others would do the same. But yeah, it, it is, uh, other uh, people would have to be open to, to do something like that, but I definitely find it useful as well. Mm -hmm. And actually just one more note on, on this whole thing. Like we also noticed that we were throwing a lot of stuff on Slack and writing. And then now we are also trying to more like if there's anything else like that's starting to get a little too long, let's get on the call. Like that's because sometimes we're getting to like a, a lot of like very big discussions and very deep and, and a lot of misunderstanding going back and forth. So we started to like, just cut it out. Like just let's, let's just see each other. Oh no, but my hair doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. I think we're entering the last five minutes of the panel. Uh, yes. So, uh, Dina, could you direct us all to towards the um, questions from the audience? I think we have one, but if people have more questions, like, please, this is the time. Just put them under the Q&A section. Yes, we have one question from an attendee about what was the aha moment in your career that when it comes to soft skills and their importance? I can share one, I guess. Go ahead. It was not, actually, it was not my, it's not related to personal, my soft skills in that way, but literally, I mean, <clears throat> when we are hiring people and it's in the games industry where we are a lot about fame and big IPs and big names. And when you then finally have this one candidate in the process where you think, wow, he or she worked on that title that must be the perfect fit for us right that that's gonna hit <clears throat> that's gonna just work out perfectly well and we've been looking for someone for over a year now we are all fully painful we need someone and then uh, everyone is fully ecstatic about getting this person on board and then you realize that <clears throat> yeah then they have suddenly this person is not performing as you think, um, not getting the team on board for the ideas they have, not, <clears throat> not relating to the team at all or to make them join forces and get them on the road to achieve the goals or sitting on the vast knowledge but not sharing it, for example, or not getting it transported to the others. And then <clears throat> this person in the end, you have to let them go because all the great talent that is there wasn't actually like speeding up or coming out in the setting. So it's always, for me, it's always about the person in the right setting. So I'm not saying that the person is wrong, but maybe the setting wasn't the right one in that way. But <clears throat> you, you get blinded by some things and where actually the soft skills would have been the, the most important part to get this person flourishing and uh, in their job and also make them happy, make the company happy, make the game team happy and have a success, right? And it was so sad, but it was an eye opener for everyone that we have to change something, right? That was, it's long ago. I'm happy that it's a long ago, a thing from the past and we're far away from that. Um, now in our um, this decision-making and hiring, but um, yeah, that was painful, but I guess it was something that we all, all need. Thank you. Maybe I can oh, go ahead, sir. 
Okay, I, I want to share an example a few years ago, and it wasn't the biggest aha moment, but I still think about it. Um, so I hired uh, for our um, external customer support and we built it up from ground and my very analytical thought was, let's hire gamers, they know how the game works, they can help other gamers the best, um, it's going to be great. And so when I started hiring and we started training people, I realized I actually don't want to hire just gamer, I actually want to hire people with empathy because I realized that the people that were very empathetic and already had like this great soft skill developed, they have been so much better at, you know, finding good solutions, like um, adjusting how they treat the player when they wrote in. Um, and of course, for them, it was also easier to learn the game because um, it's easier to learn uh, a game or a skill that straightforward than, you know, learning to be uh, very empathetic. So um, I changed the way we hired and I looked uh, for people, you know, I didn't look for gamers anymore, but for people that were very empathetic and just really wanted to help people and uh, develop themselves uh, throughout this job. So I would say, you know, my, I will also like for, you know, people that maybe want to join the gaming industry and work somewhere else right now, you know, like, showing showing in an interview how much empathy you have and even you know you can develop that everywhere in every industry you don't have to be in the gaming industry or customer service or anywhere um but yeah show them the empathy and how you can feel into the gamer i think we all work on gaming audiences that don't reflect ourselves so we have to constantly be empathetic you know uh, how are those uh, 14 year old guys think or those like 13 year old girls so I feel like bringing the skill is so so important and I hope that much more people would look for that skill um, and hire people with that skill. I think there are so many um, aha moments I had to be honest but one of my favorite ones is um, usually when I approach a project or I did and I ask for opinion or feedback, you approach people that are mind like mind like like they think the way you think um, you do that or I did it because I knew um, they probably won't give they probably will give me the feedback I want to hear because they think the same way I do. Um, and I, I learned that in like a workshop like years ago, and then I actually started to make that habit. Okay, I'm gonna go to people I actually wouldn't really go for a beer with or drink a coffee with because you know I don't really like them on a personal level. Um, but at the same time, I just wanna, you know, I'm just curious, what do they think? And having feedback from people that are not like me, don't think like me, was the, was the best thing I could have ever done. And I always do it in my project. Um, it's, it's so many different ideas came. It made the project so much better um, in so many ways. And that was my greatest aha moment to go to challenge myself to go out of, out of the comfortable zone. I know you could get maybe feedback that you don't wanna hear, but it's really like you learn yourself from it so much. So I think that was the, the one of the biggest aha moments um, that I learned in the soft skill communication area. I think we're running out of time now. Is this a hard stop? Do we have an admin on board who will <laughs> tell me? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, um, yes, like, okay, you, <laughs> we can stop now. If you have, if you want to add something like okay. a last minute thing, you can do, do that. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, thank you to everyone, especially to Dina for running this panel with with me and for everyone participating and the audience. Uh, it was way too short of a time to go deeply into this, but I hope everyone learned something about the soft skills and their importance. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> I like it. Thank Stay you. safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. See you soon. See you. Bye.